Sunday. But today we're going to continue and conclude our study in Galatians. We're in chapter 6. Let's begin reading here in Galatians chapter 6 at verse 11. We'll read verses 11 through 13 and we'll get into our study. Galatians chapter 6, verses 11 through 13. Paul writes, See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these try to compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. Now, as we begin, let's remember what Paul had just written in verses 9 and 10. Paul had just written to the Galatians that they should continue in serving the Lord. They should continue serving the Lord. He had said in verse 9, Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And as we were together last time, I concluded by looking at those two verses. I'd like to go back and use that as our foundation as we move into our conclusion. And so in verse 9, again, notice how he said, let us not grow weary while doing good. So as I mentioned before, he's saying to the church, you need to hang in there. You need to persevere because it's very easy to grow tired while doing what is good, especially if while you're doing that which is good, the blessings of God are not obvious. Sometimes you might be thinking, is it worth it? I'm doing this. I'm trying to do good. I'm trying to do good to others. I especially am trying to be good to my brothers and sisters in the Lord. But I don't see the effects. It doesn't seem to be obvious. It's not paying off. And so it's easy to grow tired while doing what is good because sometimes the blessings aren't obvious. So doing good requires continuous effort. You see, because human nature lacks staying power, it's easy to get tired while serving the Lord. Because when you serve the Lord, it's not simply just the word serving. Serving the Lord requires several things. It, if you're going to be serving the Lord, it requires discipline. It requires energy. It requires a proper ambition because you can actually serve with a selfish motive. And so if you're really serving the Lord, you need to serve with the proper ambition. You need to have a motivating goal. There needs to be a, a reason for all of this. And for us, it's the kingdom of heaven. There's a, a need for patience and there's a need for endurance when you're doing well. Because it's not always that easy. It's not always that simple. It actually is labor. Because doing good is work. And you can get tired when you work. And sometimes the work conditions may not be that, that pleasant. Marie was pregnant with my son, David. And she was helping in the children's ministry. She and I actually ministered in the nursery. That was basically one of the very first ministries I ever did in church was serving in nursery ministry. And so Marie and I served together. And, and she was pregnant. And she was one of these ladies in the early months of her pregnancy. She was one of the ladies who would get sick to her stomach fairly easy. I know that many of you ladies probably suffered in the same way. I remember Marie telling me when she was pregnant with Corinne, I was driving her home from work, and um, she was working while I was going to the beach. No, she, she was working, and we only had the one car, so I had to go and pick her up. And, and I can still remember driving on the 60 freeway, going to our apartment in Roland Heights, and, and Marie's there in the passenger seat, and she turns to me, she says, you have to pull over. And I said, I'm on the freeway. I'm on the freeway. I can't just pull over. And she looks at me, and my wife is the sweetest thing in the world. You need to understand this. But she looked at me, and she said, I'm going to vomit. And if you don't pull over, I will vomit on you. I pulled over. <laughs> and I remember pulling over as she, um, she kept her word. She, pro she vomited. And I, I was, like, blown away. I, I, I had heard that there's something called morning sickness. I'd heard that. Obviously, I'd never had it, but Marie did. And so Marie would get real queasy when she was pregnant. There were certain colors that she couldn't be around. She would actually vomit if she saw red. 
and green, so she couldn't eat salsas and various things. It was very, very miserable for me. It was one of those, but I, I put up with it, I, I must confess. It, I, she got sick. So anyway, that was, that was with Marie, and so she's now pregnant with our second child. She's pregnant with David, and she is working in the uh, nursery, and, and one of the ladies had twins, infants, and the twins were sick, and they were wearing cloth diapers, and they made a mess of their diapers, both of them, and I still remember Marie holding those diapers and washing them off in the sink, just losing it, just losing it as I ran out the door. It was just it's something I remember very well. You know, sometimes when you serve, it isn't that easy. I don't know where we get the idea that it is. Sometimes we think, oh, I want to serve the Lord. It's going to be easy. It is not easy. It is work. It can be labor. That's what it's called. And you can get tired. Now, some of you know that because you serve the Lord and, and you grow tired. It can be tiring, obviously, because it requires a, a diligence and an endurance. It, it requires a patience and energy. And that's why Paul is saying that you're supposed to uh, not grow weary while doing good because you can. You can get tired. The ushers in this church get tired. Those who are in the cleaning ministry get tired. Those who work in the cafe get tired. Those who are the greeters or those who work in the parking lot, those who serve in children's ministry, the ones who go on the missions and those who help to work in the breakfast and conferences and, and so many other things. We wouldn't be able to do these things if they didn't serve and they can get tired. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians in this way in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. He spoke of remembering without ceasing their work of faith. That word work is ergon. It speaks of the energies that they put into it, your work of faith. But he also spoke of the labor of love. That word labor is, is toil that produces fatigue. So when they would serve in their energies, they were toiling in love. And that's how you serve. That's what God calls us to do. Work, yes, but work with a heart of love. And God remembers the work that you do. You know, sometimes we need to remember something very basic. It's so basic that I, I fail to communicate this very clearly, and I don't communicate it very often. I certainly, more than likely, don't communicate it very well at all. But the bottom line is, is we've all been saved, but we're saved to serve. We're saved to serve because we are at his command. When Paul was writing to the uh, Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 22, Paul said, He who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. But he goes on to say, Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slaves. And a slave had no personal rights. They were totally owned and possessed by their master. Somewhere in the history of the church we stopped using, and it was early on, it was probably somewhere, I believe, around the 11th or 12th century, that the word slave was really not one, they didn't want to use that word in the translation very often. And so, so many of the translations that we have in our New Testament, and even the old, will we'll use the word servant. Uh, but we need to remember that that servants had certain rights, but slaves didn't. Slaves had no rights. Servants could have rights. Um, if I was a, a voluntary servant, I sold myself into voluntary servitude, I was paying off a debt, I had certain rights as a Jewish person. And so the uh, one that I sold myself to as an indentured servant uh, didn't have uh, ultimate control over my life. He couldn't put me to death, and there were a variety of things that the law actually stated he could not do, but, but it was different with slaves. It was different with slaves in the sense that I really didn't have any rights. I was at the beck and call of that master, and whether he's harsh or whether he's fair, I was a slave. And it's interesting, and I want to point that out, that, that when Paul was speaking of us, he said, likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. He was saying to us that our personal rights have been given over to, to God. God has the authority over me, and that means that, that uh, we're to do what he tells us to do. And the reason that we're to do that, there are several reasons, obviously. One, he's God, but two, 
is that he purchased us. He redeemed us. Redemption is the price of the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and so he redeemed me by the blood of the Lamb, and therefore I have been bought. I have been bought, like he says in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20, at a price. And the price of my being redeemed was the blood of Jesus Christ. And so when God redeemed you, when God purchased you, he flat out owns you. You belong to him. Now, for Americans, our sensibilities real at that. Are you saying to me that God owns me? And the answer is, yes, the Bible is saying that you are God's slave. I am God's slave. God purchased me, and I belong to him. And therefore, he has total rights over me. That's what the Bible teaches concerning our relationship with him, at least one aspect of it. In Luke chapter 17, verses 7 through 10, Jesus said it like this, Which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, Come at once and sit down to eat? But will he not rather say to him, Prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I've eaten and drunk, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise you, when you've done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty. We have done what is our obligation to do. And so when Paul is speaking to me in this passage and says, don't get tired of doing well, he's speaking to a man under orders. And the responsibility that I have as a Christian is to, even when I don't see things blossoming the way I'd like, even when the labor is long and the toil is difficult and, and the uh, dividends don't seem to be there, I'm still supposed to serve the Lord regardless because he owns me. The funny thing about that is though he does own me, he still rewards me. And he rewards us for being faithful servants. Colossians 3.24 says, Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. When you serve the Lord Christ, it puts a different spin on the service. When I got hired to be an assisting pastor on staff, my um, first work week was 70 hours. 70 hours. The job I had prior to that, which provided for my family, I would work 40 hours, and I didn't want to work 41. I would go in for my set time, and I wasn't one of these guys who would volunteer for overtime. I was doing the job, but I didn't love the job. So 40 hours were pretty much the maximum that I was willing to put into a job. But when I was released from that job, my very first work week was 70 hours. I almost doubled that, and I enjoyed it. I loved it. I loved going in early, and I love staying late because when you're serving the Lord, there's a reward to it. There's a joy to it, and that's how we can keep strong, and that's how we can endure is to remember who we are serving. Again, sometimes people get tired because there may seem to be a lack of fruit in our effort. It seems that what we're doing isn't producing very much. That's why we're encouraged to stay strong, even though we may grow exhausted. In, in 2 Thessalonians 3.13, uh, Paul said it like this, As for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Do not grow weary in doing good. That's an interesting thought because it seems to me that some people don't tire of doing evil. They enjoy doing evil. They don't get tired of doing evil. They stay up all night doing evil. But Paul has to say, don't get tired of doing good because sometimes we do. And the Bible says that we should hold on. Why? Because, because God will make us strong. Isaiah 40, verses 30 and 31 says, Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. How do I remain strong? I need to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. I need the energy of the Spirit because it's the energy of the Spirit that gives me the ability to serve the Lord in labor and to enjoy that. 
And so that's what he's saying when he says that in verse 9, don't grow tired doing those things that are good. Notice again in verse 10, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. That word opportunity, as we have opportunity, it's not simply an occasional opportunity. I happen to notice something. He's saying you have a lifetime of opportunities. A believer's entire life is looked at as an opportunity to serve, and therefore he says, let us do good. When he says, let us do good, let us actively do that which is good at all times. Let us pursue moral and spiritual excellence all the time because doing good actually is part of my witness for the Lord. It's, it's one of those living testimonies. It's, it's a living evidence that God saved me. That's why Jesus would say, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. And so when you and I, when we serve the Lord, when we're doing good, it's not simply for the right now, but we actually can have an impact for eternity. Now, as you're doing good, that includes people in general. That's why, as I was mentioning earlier, prior to beginning the study, that there's a need in Japan. And the Bible says, do good unto all men. And so we, the body of Christ in the United States, can respond to that. We can do good. But he also says, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So when you love the Lord, you're going to love people in general, but you're also going to, you're going to love his children. That's, uh, as we, we saw not that long ago as we were studying through the book of Acts, the concern for others was, was really much, uh, pretty much the earmark of the early church. You know, the word love, we use it so easy and so often. But it's a very practical word. And in the, in the early church, and the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2, 45, that the uh, believers sold their possessions and goods, divided them among all as anyone had need. They saw the need, and they would do something with generosity for them. And that's how it works. And so as he's been speaking concerning that, he is now rolling into his conclusion. And we'll look at verse 11 now. This is all an introduction to verse 11. See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. Now, when he says this, uh, see with what large letters I've written to you with my own hand. Um, there, there are various ways to look at this, and I'll share a couple of those things, a few of those things. One, it may be, look at, I wrote to you six chapters. Now, there are other books that he wrote that were longer, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Romans. Those are all much longer books, but... But when you look at Romans and you see the conclusion, it's interesting to note that Paul actually dictated that letter. There was an individual who was writing it on his behalf. And so this was written in his own hand. And uh, it would be demonstrating to the people that he had a personal concern for them. It also could be speaking of the size of the letters. Behold, the large letters remembering that he had eye problems. For him to take the time to write in the way that he would have to have written all of this to them would have demonstrated a great concern to them because it was difficult for him to write. But not only that, he's also giving to them a sense that this is an authentic letter. You need to remember that during the time of the uh, writing of the New Testament, there were those who were going about saying that the Apostle Paul had written a letter when in fact he had not. The Thessalonians had received a letter that was supposedly from Paul and it had caused great concern. And so in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul said it like this in verses 1 and 2. He said, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord had already come. And so there were those who believed that, that Paul was writing letters, and so Paul would authenticate it by giving his own signature. And so he's saying, this is a way for you to know that this is the real deal. I actually wrote this to you. And now he goes back into concluding his letter by saying, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these try to compel you to be circumcised only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. I want to spend a couple of moments developing this with you because 
he's concluding his exposure of the false teachers who had infiltrated the churches of Galatia. Remember with me, from the very beginning, the Apostle Paul has been dealing with false doctrine. Again, there are those who I've had discussions with in the past. I've heard them on television say some things similar to this. What does it really matter what you believe as long as you believe sincerely? And there are many people, especially today, that really don't put up with Bible studies. They can't. For some reason, and I think it's pretty much because our society is just very much amusement-oriented, that if it isn't amusing, it's not worth doing. Even, even Christians who go to church, if it's not amusing. Remember with me what the word amuse means. And it's a very simple word, amuse. It simply means without thinking. That's what amuse means. It's a Greek word, a muse. Muse means to think. When you put the letter a in Greek before that word, what it means is without thinking. You're not thinking. People, many people don't like to think. They don't want to be challenged to think. I think that very often they think that a Bible study is supposed to be an entertainment. That when the guy opens up the book, you better tell a lot, of, a lot of jokes and a lot of personal stories and a lot of illustrations. And what we have is we have an entire society based on, based on entertainment orientation, an inability to put up with sound doctrine. And yet it concerns me, and I have to be open with you about it, because the Bible says in the last days that people will no longer endure healthy teaching. They're going to heap into themselves teachers having itching ears. They're going to turn aside voluntarily from the truth and be turned into fables. They're going to turn, in other words, to that which is not true because it's more entertaining. One of the individuals who's on TV that people love, he's got a huge uh, group of people showing up, uh, was asked concerning whether or not he's a pastor, and he said, no, I'm a mo motivational speaker. He has got a huge group of people. He's got a $73 million budget, a yearly budget of $73 million huge group of people that come but when asked is mormonism christian he said yes because they say that Mor mormons say jesus is their is their lord and i say he's my lord and therefore they're my my brother and and the interviewer who was not it was not it wasn't a religious show it was a, a news talk program the interviewer says but mormons believe and starts telling him what mormons believe and this individual says i didn't know that yet he's pastoring the largest church in the united states when given an opportunity by Larry King, when Larry King asked him the question, are you saying that Muslims and Jews will not go to heaven if they don't have Jesus? His response was, I don't know, only God knows. Yet Jesus says in his word, if you confess me before men, I will also confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I also will deny you before my Father who is in heaven. And so rather than saying, the Bible says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If you have an argument, Larry, it's not with me, it's with Jesus Christ. If you don't like what he's saying, I have to give it to you rightly and divide it straight. This is what he said. Now, if you have a difficult time with that, then take it up with the Master. Take it up with the Creator. Take it up with the man who inspired the Word of God. Don't take it out on his servant. I'm simply giving to you the message he gave to me to give. Now, I can live with that. But when you look at somebody in the face and you've got millions of people watching you and you deny Christ, that's not a wise thing to do. That's not a wise thing to do. And if you can stand before thousands of people telling them what you think will motivate them to live a good life, maybe you ought to motivate them to live for Jesus Christ. And, and that's what Paul's talking about. Does that, do you value that? I pray you do. Because a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't. Oh, how harsh, how unloving. Muslims, Jews, Christians, we all serve and worship the same God. Really? Speak to a zealous Jew and ask him if we worship the same God. People who say that have never spoken to an Orthodox Jew. They will say, no, you don't. Speak to a zealous Muslim and say, do we worship the same God? They will say, no, your religion is a dog religion. You serve us because that's what you learn in Islam. So when we speak about Jesus Christ... And we read the word of God and we say, thus saith the Lord. It cuts against people's hearts. They get upset. They get upset. But Paul would not be on some Christian TV programs today more than once. Because if he told the truth, they'd get upset. How many times do you think John the Baptist would be interviewed on TBN? I don't think he'd be asked back. Seriously, because what he had to say cut the heart.
That's how it works. Opens it up, reveals it to you. Then you say, God, I need you. And you get right with him through humble repentance. That's what the Bible teaches. Now, as we've been going through Galatians, Paul has been making it clear. He's been speaking about those who have entered in. He said in chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, that they preach a false gospel. In chapter 2, verse 4, he referred to them as false brethren. In chapter 2, verse 5, he said, they're attempting to undermine my authority over the church. In chapter 2, verse 21, he said, they're contradicting the grace of God, supplanting it with the law of Moses. In chapter 3, verse 1, he said, their teachings are hiding Jesus from people. In chapter 4, verse 17, he says their teachings are designed to cut off their relationship with Jesus. In chapter 5, verse 1, he said they brought people into bondage rather than freedom. In chapter 5, verse 7, he said these false teachers encourage disobedience. And in chapter 5, verse 10, he said they trouble rather, rather than encouraging and they will be judged. Those are strong words. Now, why are they doing all of this? Well, he says it, to make a good showing in the flesh. As false teachers, their real goal is to capture them in order to avoid the cross of Jesus Christ. They're trying to avoid the cost of bearing the cross because they are unwilling to suffer for Jesus. You know, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 17, Jesus said, Be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to the local councils, and they will flog you in their synagogues. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, we read, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. They did not want to be persecuted. If you want to be persecuted, just be open and say, I really believe Jesus is the only way. You will definitely have people upset at you. Your own family, your friends, your coworkers, those in class at college. There are going to be people that come out of the woodwork. If you talk about God and it's kind of a nebulous, oh, there's a God, there's a great power, there's a higher power, there's some cosmic other, there's a first principle, whatever you want to call it, and people are all right with that. But when you say there is a God and he sent his son Jesus who died on a cross, now you're going to have a problem. And people very often will avoid that because they don't want what results from saying that. They don't want the persecution. He says in verse 13, for not even those who are circumcised keep the law. They can't keep the law if they deny that Jesus fulfilled it. And in their attempts to have righteousness from the law, they have failed to follow the righteousness that comes from God. Now he says in verse 14, but God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I, he says, to the world. I want you to see this with me. I'm going to take a moment to look at this. God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the last thing anyone would normally boast in. The cross was an emblem of shame. Criminals died on crosses. They would force you to bear the, the crossbar. You would carry your own instrument of death on your shoulders. They would force you to carry the cross even as Jesus carried it. And they did so in public so that all people would know that you were a criminal guilty of a capital offense. And to be hanging on a cross openly to the sh was your great shame. And so when Jesus says, deny yourself, pick up your cross daily and follow me, he was given a revolutionary call. He wasn't saying when it's convenient and when you feel like it, you can be one of mine. He was saying on a daily basis, die to yourself and be willing to bear the shame of being identified with me. Paul, by saying I'm going to boast or glory in the cross, is actually boasting in an emblem of shame. But the cross is a place where our pride is exposed, and it's at the cross that our sins are revealed. The cross is a place where God dealt with our sin, and the cross is a place where we are made right with him. 
The cross is our source of spiritual power. Remember what he said in chapter 2, verse 20? I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He was glorying in the cross because it's at the cross, it's the death of Christ that gives to us access to God, and it's the reservoir that we have spiritual power. It's where the love of God was most clearly revealed to a lost and a sinful world, the cross. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's the symbol of God's love for us. It's it's a place where God's love was most clear, clearly expressed and manifested. It, it's where God demonstrates his love for us. God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Paul said, Christ died for us. That's, that's the whole center, the cross. In 1 John, in chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This, he says, is love not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us. We love him because he first loved us. We are only responding to the love God has already shown to us. Why do I love the Lord? Because he's good to me. Because he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for me because he set me free from the bondage of sin, because he cleansed my conscience and because he gave me power to live for him, because he's blessed me with, with a great wife and wonderful children and beautiful grandchildren, a, a mom that I love with all of my heart, brothers, sisters, nieces and nephews, brothers-in-law and sisters-in-law, because he's been good to me. I love him. And so do you, for the same kinds of reasons. Because he washed you clean. Because he showed great patience, he endured for so long for you to come to him, whether it was 20 years or 30 years or 40 years or whatever. He showed long suffering with you. He didn't want you to perish. I have in my... Um, in my office, a plaque. I've had it for many years now, about 30. And it simply says this, I asked Jesus, how much do you love me? And he said, this much. And he stretched out his hands and he died. How much do you love me? This much. I have a picture of my daughter, Corinne, at the age of a year and a half. We were on the campus at Cal Poly Pomona. I used to go to Cal Poly. And uh, my little girl, I asked my Karini, I said, honey, I said, do you love your daddy? And she said, yes. And I said, how much? And she started stretching her little arms out. And I said, that's not very much. And so she tried to stretch it as far as she could. And she's got this strain in her little face. You can see her straining as she's stretching as far as she can. And we got the picture of her, and I still have it. And so when I'm mad at her, I pull it out and I look at it. <laughs> then I send it to her. How much do you love me? I love you this much. How much, Jesus, do you love me? I love you this much. It wasn't nails that keep, kept Jesus on the cross. It was his love for you. It was his love for you. Nails couldn't keep him on a cross. His love did. And his holiness. He's got a righteous father, a holy father, and he's a holy savior. But we're unholy people. So justice needed to be served. A perfect sacrifice needed to be given. God sent the perfect sacrifice, his own son. In obedience, with the desire to satisfy the righteous demands of his father, Jesus came. He was placed voluntarily on a cross for us, nailed to it, 
but it was love and obedience that kept him there. So why should you love Jesus Christ? Why should you? Because he first loved you. And because you could never outgive him, you could never do more for him than he did for you. And that's why we love him. The cross. The cross is where love's clearest expression was manifested. And the cross is what is used by God to remove the love for the world from me. Clearly understanding that Jesus suffered and died for me, for you, results in you and me, results in our turning our hearts to him. When you can have a glimpse, and they come every once in a while, of what God has done for you, it changes your life. It changes the way you think, and it changes the way you live when you see that. So naturally, the cross has to be center of all true preaching, and that's the difference between a genuine teacher and a false one. The false teacher will direct your attention to themselves, to their opinions, to their organization. The genuine teacher points you to the cross of Jesus Christ. It's like what Paul said to the Philippians in chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. He said, What things were gained to me, these I've counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. So he goes on. In Christ, verse 15, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. All who accept the claims of the gospel, may peace and mercy be upon them. That he would refer to, according to verse 16, as being the true Israel of God. The true Israel of God would be those Jewish believers who are regenerated through faith in Christ. Like he said to the Romans in chapter 2, verse 20, 29, he is a Jew who is one inwardly. Circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men but from God. In Romans 4.12, he said, Abraham is the father of the circumcision, father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but also who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. And so it's always been faith and God's grace that works through us that we might have a relationship with him. And he finally says in verse 17, let no one trouble me. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Take this message to heart and cease causing me concern over you. My physical wounds suffered for Jesus should be sufficient to establish my credentials. While these others are unwilling to communicate to you the power of the cross, I have paid a tremendous price for preaching that. And Paul was one who had been beaten. He had been scourged. He had been shipwrecked. Many nights in the deep, he had been hungry and many fastings and long times of prayer. He'd gone through so many things, and that's why he says, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at me and see my physical wounds. That should be sufficient to establish my credentials. There are those who want to be leaders who've never earned their stripes. They want to be leaders just because you may have a bar on your collar. When I was in the military, they had bars. They had silver bars and all lieutenants, second lieutenants, and all of that, captains. You didn't necessarily listen to the guy who just gotten out of school. He may have that little bar on his, on his collar. You'd listen to the hardened sergeant the guy who'd gone through something, the guy who understood, the guy who knew the ropes, the guy who'd been there, the veteran, the guy who had experience. Just because somebody may be able to talk out of the Bible doesn't mean that this person is walking according to the Bible. Just because somebody has eloquence, somebody might have 
have an ability to communicate, might have so many various things that, that endear him to others, doesn't mean that he's worthy of following. You have to make sure that that person has the credentials. And Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of Christ. If you ever want to see the most open-hearted letter of the Apostle Paul, read 2 Corinthians. When you read 2 Corinthians, you'll find no less than 21 times he has to answer accusations that have been lodged against him. No less than 21 times. Because the Corinthians had infiltrators, and the infiltrators had come in and they said things like, he's not worthy of supporting. They said his yes, his yes, his no, his no. This man is not really saying yes and no. His yes can be no, and his no can be yes. He's a double-minded man. They said he's, a, he's got weighty letters, but in person he's just, uh, he's just, uh, he's just weak. Yeah, he's not even good looking. I mean, there were so many things that they said about the Apostle Paul. And, and from chapter 1 all the way to the conclusion, no less than 21 times he has to answer the things that were said against him. He even had to go so far as to boast about things that had occurred in his life, things that he wanted to keep silent, even things like when he went to the third heaven and, and was there before the Lord. And, and he said, I saw things that are not lawful for me to express to you. He says, you want to talk about visions? You want to talk about the variety of things that God has done? He said, truly the signs of an apostle have been done through my hand. I've got credentials. He had told them earlier, though you may have 10,000 instructors, yet you have but one father. I begot you in the gospel. How can, how can you turn your heart away from me? How can you turn your backs on me? When these infiltrators have come in and they do you no good, they only do you harm. That's what false teachers do. They glory in your flesh. And they glory in the money you give to them. They glory in the ability they have to brag about how many people show up to listen to them. But Paul said, look at me. He wasn't a good-looking man whatsoever. The only description we really have that may be accurate was that he was a small man with a big nose, oversized head, and he had a back condition and bad eyesight. He was not impressive to look at. But he had something about him, and he said, look at me, and you'll see someone who bears the wounds of Jesus Christ, somebody who has lived for him, somebody who is literally burning out for him right before your eyes. And that's what Paul said. Let no one trouble me. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. And then finally he says, brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. In contrast to the law of Moses, may your life be filled with the grace of Jesus Christ. May it live in your heart. May it enlighten and change your soul. And may God's grace be conspicuous in your life. And may that be so for us.